folks, I'm here in Namibia right now with my good friend Matt Granger. And if you're not familiar with my channel, Matt and I co-lead these photo tours around the world. And we're currently wrapping up our 2016 trip to Namibia. Thanks for joining me today, Matt. Pleasure. Today we're going to talk about the Sony Alpha system, specifically the uh, A7 series, and really how suitable it is for this kind of use in Africa. Uh, over the last two weeks, we've been abusing the gear over Ethiopia and Namibia and the Namib Desert and the Kalahari. And it's held up, but it certainly has some deficiencies. So I want to talk a little bit about the lens selection, a little bit about the quality of the Sony um, gear and the Zeiss gear that's available for it, and also how it compares to the competitor's gear, particularly from Nikon. Cool. Matt, what setup did you bring to Namibia? Uh, well, I haven't brought all of it out, but the two bodies I'm using are the 810. Um, I brought them with the lens I've been using the most for wildlife stuff. Of course, Jonathan and I on this trip have shot landscape, people, villages, stuff out of moving car windows, as well as strictly safari stuff. So this has been my safari setup, 810 and the Tamron 150 to 600. And the new Nikon D5 with the 200 F2. And this one's with a two times teleconverter, so that makes it a 400 f4. That's a, a really sweet setup, and you can tell by how dirty it is that we really have been. I just using noticed today and it's, um, this gear. it's been brassed and everything as well. Yeah, all yeah, we're paint coming off it too. And, yeah, so mud. it's um, that's a very heavy setup as well. So it's something we'll talk about. But that's kind of the point. When you get gear like this, you know it's built to use. Yes. People who are actually out, I'm not you know, dissing people, if you can afford it, buy whatever, but you know that there's a reason photojournalists have traditionally used bodies like this. Right. You and could roll this down the hill and it'll be okay. And just a little bit of background. I've gone through in the last six months or so, three different A7R2 bodies. One of them died on me in Mongolia, in the yep. Eagle Festival that we did together. Uh, one of them died on me in the Amazon. Uh, one of them died on me at home, which is really my fault. I spilled some juice on it. And now I'm on body number four. And so far it's been doing pretty well here in, in Africa, but I'm having to clean it out. And I'm learning that you really have to baby this gear much more than I would like to baby it now. Yeah. Whereas Matt can just you know, grab and go. This thing's built like a tank. Uh, my Sony is not really. And I think that's probably for me the biggest downside to the Sony kit is that it's not really meant to do this kind of hardcore, off the beaten path, uh, you know, extreme elements type use. Should clarify too, this is not like going to the park to shoot things. It gets so dusty on the trip. I had this in my lap one day with my hand like that and fell asleep. And when I lifted my hand up, there was a black handprint yeah. where the dust hadn't gone. Yeah, at the end of the day, our hair is, you know, standing up. It's like we've been, you know, working in a plaster factory or something like that. Uh, a little bit about the lenses that I brought on this trip. I'm filming currently with the A7R2. I didn't bring two bodies, so we're having to film with this one body. I'm using the uh, Zeiss Battis 18 lens, which uh, I've enjoyed using. Matt has been kind enough to lend me his copy of it. I also brought uh, the Battis 25, great for landscapes. I haven't found myself using this lens too much, actually. Okay. Uh, oh, I have my uh, Loxia 35. For some reason, I forgot to bring it out here to look at, uh, but it's also been an excellent lens. It's been my preferred lens when we've been shooting the villagers, particularly the Himba and in uh, Ethiopia. Just love the focal length, uh, the 35 focal length for people photography. I find it very natural, a little bit of a wide angle. It gives a nice look and the Loxia is a pleasant lens to use, which by the way is another benefit of the Sony system. You can go lightweight. Mm -hmm. uh, you have these wonderful lenses from Zeiss, including the Battis and the Loxia. Uh, can't do that on the Nikon. Your thoughts? Well, I guess, yeah, so that's a, an advantage. I guess, I think a big problem with the discussions about mirrorless so often are that people perceive a benefit that everyone's gonna get from them. So size and weight is perceived as the benefit. For me, that was never a benefit. So the ability, and you can still customize a bunch of different lenses to go onto a Nikon or Canon body from other cameras, but just not as many. You can customize everything to go on a Sony body. It's a definite benefit. But, for me, you know, the, on a trip like this, I wouldn't do it. The, the fact that you can use a little Loxia lens or a giant Otis lens or any old lens you find in the cupboard and you get the peaking and all of that, peaking's not super accurate. Definitely And not. unless you have a bunch of experience, it's, it's not fast. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's true, you know, I can't go too light with a D5. No, I mean, Even this, if this... I get the 50 mil <laughs> manual focus. This is a good... That's five kilos right there. But so that, 
let's get this lens off. That is the camera with the 50 mil lens. Yeah. So that's relatively a lot lighter, but yeah, sure, it's never gonna be as light as that. But there comes the trade-off that my battery weighs about as much as your camera. <laughs> yes. So I can shoot for three days like crazy and not worry about the battery at right. all. Which is another interesting point. Um, I haven't had to change my battery during the days once on this trip. And yesterday was one of our heaviest shooting days. Uh, I took about 750 shots and didn't change the battery. I got back and it was almost dead, but I think the battery issue on the Sony is a little bit overblown. Unless you're shooting video or looking yes. at the screen a lot. So to be right. fair, uh, he has a hood on his, like this guy, yeah, which is blocking the eye sensor. So the rear screen after shooting never turns on. And I think that's a big battery. Probably. Lock. So if you want to get 700 shots, turn your rear screen off. Now let me move on to the biggest downside, in my opinion, uh, besides durability, of using a Sony for any sort of wildlife photography. Uh, there are no native telephoto lenses so far for the FE mount. Uh, what I've been doing is using my Sigma uh, 500mm f4.5 for the alpha mount, for the A mount, and using the LAEA4, that's the adapter with the little translucent mirror inside. And, you know, this adapter, let me just say, if you're, if you're using a native Sony lens, it will focus it just as fast as it focused on your A99 or whatever camera you're using in, in A mount. However, uh, I'm stuck with the Sigma and the, it's a screw drive lens and it's extremely slow focus, extremely slow. I'm missing a few shots, uh, but it hunts. And while optically it's pretty decent, uh, I really miss having uh, a native telephoto lens. One of the other guests on this trip is using a D810 with the Nikon 500 millimeter F5. And F4. the way, oh, it's F4, right, yeah. thank you. The F4 and the way it grabs focus, I mean, it's just night and day. It would be like using, say, you know, the Batis 25, which works wonderfully on the A7 body, uh, but on a telephoto lens, it's just, you know, full screen coverage, instant capture, and, you know, you're confident that you're gonna really not miss any shots with that. And it's really, it's the same deal with Matt and this setup. Today he was letting me play with this a little bit and the way it can grab focus from a distance, it even focus right on the eye of a bird in the tree perfectly. Whereas this, I'd have to center point it, you know, focus it, re, uh, reposition and everything. This is just boom, done, shot is perfect. And so, you know, I mean, obviously this is a, a very expensive setup, but it gets the job done. And if you can afford it, I think this is a far superior system for safari and wildlife and sports than the Sony Alpha. Now, I've, uh, I think you could probably say that I was formerly a Sony fanboy. I always realized that it did have its downsides. But on this trip, having played with some of the other guests, uh, real expensive telephoto lenses and, and top, top line bodies, uh, I realized just how far Sony has to go in their FE system to make it you know, really top notch as far as sports and wildlife. And they're not there yet. Hopefully this, the rumored A9 body that's coming out is going to address some of these concerns. But for now, uh, something like this, or even a D810, that's the way to go really for wildlife photography. Two, two things that come up from that. One, I, so I've shot a lot of Sony. I love Zeiss lenses. And for the record, I also use Tamron lenses. So I'm not against using off-brand stuff. But I think when you love something, it's easy to recalibrate your expectations. So when I was shooting a lot with the A7, R2, S2, and other Sonys, you understand, okay, so here's my focus level. And occasionally on a trip like this or other times, you would think, oh, I would have got that awesome shot of the Rhino, but it focused on the bushes, not on its nose or whatever. But when you're right into the system, you can just kind of accept it. But stepping back, having used the A7R2 for a couple of trips, then I went back to using the, the bigger Nikons, it's like, whoa, that focused in a challenging situation way faster than the Sony ever, 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 ever has yeah. with any lens. They do. Well, you know, it's, it's actually, it's, uh, it's called the investment bias. When yeah. you're deeply invested in anything, it could even be a relationship, you know, you oversee the faults yeah. and you overemphasize the positives and have to admit, I, I was guilty of that uh, with regards to the Sony system. For light, having a lightweight kit, taking it on backpacking trips, portraiture, things where it's, uh, the conditions aren't necessarily extreme, it's wonderful. The sensor is beautiful, the resolution, the dynamic range, the Zeiss lenses, uh, they work a treat. But on these sort of things, we have found the one area where I'm really wishing I'd had a big monster system like this. 
there's another side to that, I guess, that we're comparing it to the absolute top of the line Nikon right. and a very high-end Nikon in the D810. It's a competitor and, though, it's the same price range. Yeah, but comparing these two, I can still see a huge difference in autofocus. And when you get a cheaper Nikon, which would be a lightweight alternative, the focus is rubbish too. Okay. Um, so that's something. But that's even fair. like uh, you were talking about your Sigma, having to use that to get a long one. So Nikon don't have a direct competitor to this, a 150 to 600. There's an obvious huge difference between these two in terms of focus. But even when I switch them, if I put the Tamron onto the D5, it suddenly becomes a whole new lens. Yeah. So, it, you know, bottom uh, line, you get what you pay for, and the D5, uh, having played with it myself, it's just extremely impressive camera. The other thing that I found a lot with the Sony's, and I don't know if you, I think you had it at least once, uh, I found that it locked up a lot for me. Yeah. I heard from a lot of viewers that they never had that, but inexplicable pauses, going to turn it on and three seconds of waiting, when you can't leave your camera on all day because of battery issues, and still, whilst you say you had a full day of shooting, you are trying to conserve it, right? You're turning off oh, the sure. communication, you're turning off the screens and everything like that. This, it just sits in, <clears throat> excuse me, it sits in my lap on all day. So if we spot an Oryx, you know, it's just ready to fire. Whereas the Sony, you need to turn it on. And it yep. might be half a second, but you if have a you get a three second time. delay, you miss it. Yep, uh, especially cats, you know, like there was a, a leopard yesterday that I missed. You know, it was a combination of the boot up time and then focusing this beast, the screwdriver like that and by the time that it was focused the leopard had ducked into the grass and all I got was a silhouette so uh, so yeah uh, you know I should mention before I get too down on the Sigma that there are other options for for the Sony system you can buy the native a mount 500 or 300 2.8 uh, they're, they're quite expensive lenses they're right up there if not more than the equivalents from Nikon more I think quite significant yeah but you know you're buying into a dead mount in that point um, you know, so you can get a metabones potentially yes. uh, I think it will be slower as well but yeah as you say always having to use an adapter is a bummer but to, a bummer. Be, to be fair to Sony uh, Nikon are approaching their hundred year anniversary and oh. they're 15 or 20 both Nikon and Canon and they're both approaching, what, it'll be 15 or 20 years they've been in digital photography. So, and, you know, these lenses, they've been making them for way before digital. So they have that time. I think if you looked at where Nikon and Canon were a few years into their progress, and compared it to wow. the Sony's, they're doing really well. But yeah. I mean, it is still something. So yes, you're comparing it as of today, that to that. Yes. But it's not like they're just sitting around and not releasing stuff. They're actually bringing out a lot of stuff. They are, and there's promise with the rumors we're hearing about the A9. Uh, could be uh, the latest, I think, is a 72 megapixel sensor. And you know, the big thing for me now is going to be durability and focus accuracy with the long lens. And hopefully they'll come out with some native long glass for this sort of use. Yeah, and it is good to see Tamron and I think Sigma as well. The, if they aren't making them already, they've intimated that they're going to be making it's stuff great. for Sony. We so, need... yeah. Yeah. One quick note, I have been using the uh, G Master 85 a little bit on this trip. Really fun lens to use. Uh, so thanks to the Sony Professional Services, professional support for lending me this lens. Uh, the portrait, the bokeh on this is really, it's as good as advertised. It's a wonderful lens. I'm seriously thinking about buying one when I get back. So maybe just to um, round things out to make it a fair thing for Sony, maybe finish the video with a, a gallery of your shots. To, yeah. To show you can still get great stuff. It's just, I found myself being like a fisherman on this trip. I'm more fixated on the shots that got away than the ones <laughs> that always, I got. There's always, you can't get, yeah, you can't get frustrated by that. Uh, we're having a great time, you know, like I say, Matt and I lead these trips around the world. We've got Mongolia in winter coming up. Uh, Peru is only a couple months away and we're always going to new and exciting places to keep it interesting. So check back on this channel, check out Matt's channel, it'll be linked to below. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Cheers guys.